Hello everyone. Welcome to the Living Systems Lab, a collaboration between MAT and the Central St. Martins University of the Arts London. MAT, the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology, has a pleasure to partner with the academic field to create a space of dialogue and thinking on contemporary scientific, technological and artistic practices, hoping to prototype a better future. We would like to thank all the participants, more or less uh, 200, the invited speakers and the staff who have made this collaboration possible. The Living Systems Lab is a research group dedicated to exploring the inherent proprieties of living systems to develop new knowledge in the field of ecology through creative practices in art, design and architecture. Cahor Kouhe and Heather Barnett, who are coordinating the lab, will explain in further detail the strengths of the, of the Living Systems Lab. Carol Collet is a professor in design for sustainability, sustainable futures at Central St. Martins, where she is the director of Maison Zéro and the director of the Design and Living Systems Lab. She has pioneered the integration of sustainability in the curriculum at Central St. Martins by founding the, M the MA in Textile Futures and the first MA in Biodesign. Her research includes biomaterial prototyping, as well as exhibition and conference curator and publications. She is a keynote speaker and regularly contributes to conference on the subjects of biodesign, material futures, and sustainable fashion. Heather Barnett is an artist, researcher, and educator working with natural phenomena and complex systems. Employing living organisms, imagining technologies and playful pedagogies, her work explores how we observe, influence and understand the world around us. She is pathway leader on the MA Art and Science and director of the Art and Living Systems Lab at Central St. Martins. And chair London Laser, a regular talk series exploring art and science. We invite the audience to participate by sending us comments and questions through the Zoom chat. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. And I'll pass the word now to Heather and Carol. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. We are delighted to be here with you. And we will offer you a, a fast and rapid deep dive into our world of art, design, and biology. Um, thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you to the MAT team for uh, making this collaboration happen. Um, we are based at Sandra St. Martins. We are a, re a research group dedicated to really uh, look into biological systems, biological principles, and we're really interested in the notion of ecology and network technology. And we're looking at embedding these principles in our creative practice via art, design, and architecture. Next. So we will all be presenting today. You'll get to know a little bit more. Um, what we produce is a, is a whole range of uh, various research outputs uh, from practice-based research, uh, designing artifacts, designing uh, new systems, prototyping materials, all the way to curation, whether it's exhibition conferences, and of course, writing and publications. Next. But we're also all involved in lecturing. Uh, we are passionate uh, about our practice, but we're passionate about sharing that knowledge and developing pedagogies around the notion of working with living systems. Um, so the Living Systems Lab has two strands, an art and living systems and a design and living systems strand. We're connected to a grow lab, which is a biology, key, uh, a biology lab we've set up at Central St. Martins for artists and designers. And we're connected to three key courses, the MA Art Science, the MA Biodesign and the MA Material Futures. We also have a PhD, a PhD group and we also from time to time have uh, visiting researchers. What I will do now is pass you on to Nancy Denish, uh, who is course leader for the Masters in Biodesign, and she will be show showing you a little bit more what we mean by the Grow Lab. Nancy, up to you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everyone. Very happy to be here. So this is the Grow Lab. It's a really amazing infrastructure that we have at Central St. Martins that was a project that was initiated by, and thanks to uh, Carol and Heather, 
It's over one year old now. Uh, and this is a biosafety level one category lab. And it has all this equipment that allow us to work with living systems, but uh, it's essentially to introduce students to working in a laboratory environment. So he has all the equipment to allow that. I won't go through the list, but it allows a set of experimentation in terms of scientific protocols and experimentation with living organisms. Next. So these are images of the MA bio students working. So uh, it's a biological lab, biology lab for designers and scientists. And we are here, you can see images performing different kinds of tasks within scientific and experimental planning during an experiment in the lab. So we do a lot of observation, documentation, we do a lot of data acquisition and imaging. So it's really about learning how to observe microorganisms and manipulate them into incorporating these into design thinking and making. So next. So what we see here in the, this slide is some images of the work we developed in the MA Biodesign Unit 1, which is a unit that is mostly dedicated to introduce students to observing microorganisms, manipulating mi microorganisms, and teaching them a new language in terms of visualization, representation of phenomena that we don't apprehend with the naked eye. So you can see here, there's a wide range of images that try to translate microscopic imaging, qualitative and quantitative analysis, and using and borrowing actually scientific methods of data acquisition. And this is something we are very excited with and Alice introduced this kind of um, um, software packages, which are not available or you know, naturally uh, available to designers. So basically we introduce microscopy, we introduce biochemistry notions, we observe living systems in, with, with different kinds of, uh, of, of scales. But we also see this as a new representation of biological phenomena, as a new way of drawing. I say this a lot. Uh, and it's, it's essentially a new way of communication and representation in design, in a design discipline. Next. And here you can see the application of the living systems in experimentation work. You can see in the images above, you can see bacterial dyes and how you can start now applying living systems into materials. And then in the image below, you see mycelium, transformation of mycelium, inoculation of mycelium in, in waste, and then, then starting to translate that into design, into a modular system, into materiality. So this is what I had to say. Next. Okay, so I'll step in at this point. Um, hello, my name is Heather Barnett, and the GROW Lab is also used to host resident uh, visitors. So the images you see here are our first scientist in residence that we hosted last November, um, a Professor Wataru Hijikata from Tokyo Institute of Technology, Central St. Martins has an ongoing relationship with this university in Tokyo. And we were really pleased to invite the uh, Professor Hijikata for a week long intensive hackathon. So we recruited students from across Central St. Martins from art and design courses. Um, to hack his scientific research. He works with energy harvesting and artificial um, biological uh, systems for artificial pacemakers. So he presented his scientific research and opened it up for the students to interrogate from their art and, science, art and design perspectives. So they hacked the, the, the research from uh, social, ethical and philosophical perspectives, offering up a translation and reinterpre reinterpretation of that science back to the scientists. And the week-long intensive hackathon ended with a public symposium, uh, sharing those processes with a public audience. And the lab also supports work done um, across the MA Art and Science course, which has been running for nine years now at Central St. Martins. And a lot of our students are working with, with biology as subject and as medium and process. Um, this is a project from a few years ago before we had the lab, uh, where we student was working with an, a, an external uh, scientist collaboratively. And this was a bacterial study of a 16th century book, uh, a, a book of Ovid's, a copy of Ovid's Metamorphosis found in a charity shop. And together the artist and the scientist mapped the 
the microbial content of those pages. So the fingers that had touched those pages over centuries um, were analyzed and extracted, creating beautiful colonies of, of bacteria. Um, and then more recently, a, a student from MA Art and Science that graduated just this year, working with mycelium, uh, creating an installation that shared her learning of, of the mycelial growth patterns um, and invited others in to, to view these growth boxes. I shall pass back to Carol to run through the procedures for this afternoon. So you will have seen the, the program most likely, uh, you will have received information, but just to recap a little bit, uh, if you're on Instagram, please use the hashtag living systems mat. Uh, this is going to be something we will be populating all afternoon. Uh, we've gone through a brief introduction so you know a bit more who we are and how we work at Central St. Martins, but we didn't want you to just uh, stay and sit and be passive all afternoon. So we decided we'd start the symposium with an interactive experiment that Heather will take a lead on. So you become an active participant uh, and learn how to observe and understand living systems. We'll then have a little break. Uh, and then from uh, 3.05, you will then be uh, introduced to a, a panel and, and a series of presentations from each of us. And this will be chaired by Adrian Holm. Thank you, Adrian, for chairing this. Uh, we will each have 10 minutes to introduce you to our respective world of research and how we do work and understand uh, living systems. And we will then conclude with a Q&A. Uh, where you'll be able to use your Q&A uh, button. If you look uh, at the bottom of your screen on your Zoom, you should be able to see a Q&A button and you'll be able to use this to pop your questions in. Next. Next, yeah. Um, and you can see, uh, if you want to follow more our work, you can use all those respective um, um, Instagram accounts. Uh, we can pop them in a the chat as well if you don't have time to write them down now. And I'll now take you straight back to Heather so that we can begin um, a very special interactive experiment. Thank you, Carol and Nancy. Um, okay, when working with living systems, it is important to observe and learn from the organism. You cannot impose your will upon another life form to get it to perform for you, to fulfill your creative aspirations. You need to work with it, to try to understand its needs, to speculate on how it understands its surroundings. And anyone in the audience today who has worked with living matter will know this takes time. So today, as we focus on different creative practices which engage living systems, we have created a small pocket of time here and now to invite you to undertake your own observations from a small scale encounter with another living being. In a moment, I will invite you to participate in an observational exercise. I will give you a series of instructions for simple actions, which you can do wherever you are. These prompts derive from a project entitled Small Acts of Being, developed in collaboration with fellow artist and educator Sarah Christie and design theorist and philosopher Betty Marenko. Together we've been exploring ways in which we can use the digital tools we have all grown accustomed to in recent months to facilitate more embodied and situated experiences, a way to connect physical, virtual and imagined spaces and a way for us to attune to our surroundings from different perspectives. We'll be using the chat box to share observations when we return from our short journey away from the screen. So here's the invitation, small acts of being, act one, interspecies encounters. What I'd like you to do is to set a timer on your phone or watch for 10 minutes. Don't start it yet, we will synchronize that so we all come back at the same time. When instructed, I'd like you to wander into your environment and find another living thing. Tune into this other form of life and observe it closely. Think about what it perceives, how it senses, how it understands time. Think about what it knows of your existence and how you relate to it. You can take a photograph of it or photograph the place where you found it. After 10 minutes, return to the group. Okay, so I'll leave these instructions up 
Um, and on the count of three, we can set your timers and you can wander off for 10 minutes and see what life you can find and contemplate. So three, two, one. Enjoy your little ex excursion. Okay, hopefully you went somewhere interesting and found another living thing to contemplate. Um, I'll give it a moment was when people for people to come back. Okay, so when you're when you're back in your seat after your encounter. What I'd like to do is ask you a series of questions um, and I'd like you to put the answers in the chat. So think about the living organism that you've just observed. In the chat box without saying what it is, could you answer the following questions? So don't reveal the nature of the living thing that you found. First question, how does it perceive the world? and make sense of its environment. And you're invited to write your thoughts into the chat. How does it perceive the world and make sense of its environment? Okay, they're coming in now. I don't know that it does. Temperature around it, through temperature, based on daylight, through water, in terms of light and dark, very slowly, light, through chemical and light interactions and humidity, through vibrations, through its legs, multiple eyes. These are intriguing sounding organisms. I can't keep up with the chat. Through biological responses, light and air from down to up. Through light, temperature, sound changes, through perceptors, light, day and night, through heat. Okay, thank you. What few more, a little flurry more. Okay. The next question, how does time behave in this organism's world? How does time behave in this organism's world? It makes it grow, age and die daily and seasonally, it has its own circadian rhythm similar to ours. I guess in the exact way it does for us with sunset and sunrise, evolve in color, daily movement cycles, time equals growth, light and dark, like a balloon that inflates and deflates. I would imagine measured by consumption and growth and eventually reproduction. Time is experienced by cycles of its leaves when it is reno renovated. It takes time to grow and to be cut. It will curl itself up in the evening. This is beautiful poetry you're creating here. Time is crucial, dried up, your life. Time moves more slowly from its reference points. If I were to put a little human brain into it, relative to our perception of time, days must be like minutes. Time equals death of parts. It veils its existence. These are fantastic. Okay, there's another couple of questions. So I'll let this one finish. And as you're adding the remainders of your chat there. The third question. How do you relate to it? What does it mean to you? How do you relate to it? And what does it mean to you? I care for it. soft and reckless. I would normally pass it by without little thought. Watched it grow and wilt. Food for me, it cares for me. It is food, but also it protects my food. Empathy, visually pleasing me. We're now firm friends. It protects me. Servant, it makes my oxygen. Comfort, this one is prolific and poisonous. It's reciprocal, breathes like me. I feel a sense of disconnection. It pleases me to have it in my room. 
observe, pick, it looks beautiful. It propels and truncates me. It is a fellow earthling, I love it. It's a friend, I relate to it by watering it. I love it, but it doesn't always love me. It makes me wonder. I care for it and it feeds me. Okay, and the last question. What does it want? What does this organism, this living thing that you found, what does it want? Sugar. It feeds me life, heat, survive. Light, air and water. What doesn't it want? Sunlight. It wants to live, to procreate and keep the species alive. I don't think it wants, it just is. Nothing. Above all, to exist and multiply. It wants to survive. It wants to feel interaction, maybe. It asks for nothing from humans. It needs sunlight and water. Inattention, mistakes from prey, nutrition, safety, compliment. Carelessness by prey. Wants food, wants light, wants love and care to grow. It wants to serve us. Quiet. Wants to live. Both water and sunlight. Grow and exist. Thank you for creating a fantastic Zoom concrete poem. I'm really intrigued. I want to know what all these organisms are, but we can't share because there are 110 of you. And we, so we, can't, we don't have time today to ask each of you, but what we can do is tell the outside world via Instagram or Twitter, if you're not on Instagram. Um, so this last part of this interactive session is to share your interspecies encounter on Instagram with the hashtag living systems M-A-A-T, living systems Matt. Um, and you can also add the second hashtag small acts of being which is the, the larger project that this uh, exercise is part of. So what we'll do in a second, I'll leave this up for a moment so you can get started, but hopefully you took some photographs um, or of the organism, or if it was too small, of the place that you found it. Um, and you can share some of those comments, those observations, those contemplations, um, along with the photograph on Instagram. And in a moment, I will switch screen to... Um, to the live feed for Instagram and we'll see what images you can create. So make a note, living systems, M-A-A-T, small acts of being, hashtags. We'll go to Instagram first, but we will look at Twitter as well. Okay, so I shall switch over and we'll see what we've got. I might need to stop sharing and start sharing again. Okay. Right, so Instagram feed, if I refresh, this is from earlier, if I refresh, hopefully in this experiment, we'll have some nice images. Oh, nothing yet. Oh, living systems. I'm looking at the hashtag living systems M-A-A-T. Is there anything there yet? No, don't be shy people. Let me just check if I'm doing it right. Maybe I'm being impatient and we've not had enough time. I think it takes a bit of time to um, upload the image, write the hashtag. I've just done mine. Okay, great.
problem is I'm not much of an Instagram user, so where do I go? Someone said, just go to the stories. I need, I need an Instagram user to help me out because there are eight posts, but they're not showing up here. So how do I get them to show? Ah, most recent over down here. Okay, we've got some lovely images. So I'll keep refreshing as they appear. So we've got the plant, looks like lichen, another plant. Oh, a tiny seed germinating. And what fruit, are they hops? No. Okay, and another one. Oh, what's that intriguing thing? Something in the water looks like a root. Or is it a, a, um, an orchid, maybe, or some plant that's got very spindly stems? Okay, some trees looking out from the window. I think the view that we're all very familiar with in recent months of seeing the seeing the world from a, from more confined spaces than we are used to. It is an orchid. Stefan has confirmed. Keep them coming. Oh, what's that? Oh, orange peel is that? And the plant photographed through other plant leaves. These are lovely photographs. Keep them coming. We've got a few minutes. We're in no rush. As I said, biology and living systems all takes time. And this is really nice to see all these images appearing. Let's just have a quick look at Twitter. Um, see if there's anything appearing for living systems. Okay, great. We've got an interspecies encounter with your yogurt, Joshua. Fabulous. It's hard to imagine how your yogurt perceives you. But the imagining is the fun bit. Okay, let's go back to Instagram. We've got a few more. Oh, what's that? Some kind of husk, coconut husk. A plant. These are great. Oh, that's nice too. Okay, I think lots of people found house plants. And nice close up, little, the little nodes of growth, the details. I bet you've never spent 10 minutes looking at a plant before. We'll give it a couple more minutes just to collect a few more. And I'll keep refreshing. Hmm, what do you think that is? scroll through them like this. You can see each one individually.
So all across the world, wherever you are, we've collected together a whole curated collection of living systems, each with their own sensory perception of their world, each with their own desires and needs and wants. Let me do one more refresh and then we break. <laughs> you found a cat, <laughs> the resident cat. All right, I'll just flip back to Twitter, see if anything else is there. I was thinking of trees and forest. If that was taken right now, in, you know, in the last few minutes, I'm very, very jealous if that's where you are. I'm in North London, which isn't quite so nice and open. Okay, well, I think what we'll do is we will take a break. You can keep adding to the Instagram feed. Um, it's quarter two now, so we'll come back at three o'clock. We'll have another quick look at the Instagram feed before we hand over to Adrian and he'll introduce the presentations for this afternoon. But thank you so much for taking part in this little interspecies encounter and experiment um, of contemplating and observing a life form close to you um, and I hope that you enjoy thinking about that living system and how it how it perceives and understands its environment but also how you relate to it and what the relationships are between different species. Hello and welcome back um, after the break. Before we hand over to the next bit I'm just going to share the Instagram feed again because loads more beautiful images have popped up during the uh, break. So let me just quickly share the Instagram feed. And I think a couple of people have just joined. So what you missed was a little experiment um, where people were invited to go and contemplate another living being in their environment um, and to think about how it perceived, how it sensed its environment, how they related to it. Um, and then they're invited to take photographs and post them on Instagram with the hashtag living systems, M-A-A-T, living systems mat. So I'm just going to scroll through these are absolutely gorgeous photographs and such an array of living matter from mushrooms, plants, lichen, seeds, the husks of skins. And, and human contemplation as well. So that might be another human being or you contemplated yourself in those 10 minutes, which is a perfectly okay thing to do. Absolutely lovely images. I'm intrigued what some of them are. Some of them are obvious and some of them are less so. Beautiful abstract geometries and patterns structures and behaviours, <laughs> beautiful close-up of a cat. Um, so do keep adding those um, and other comments and observations throughout the rest of the afternoon at Living Systems Matt hashtag. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing. Oh, I'm also going to mention thank you so much for the comments in the chat. There, there's so many really nice comments. I think I'm going to turn it into a poem and then ask the museum if they'll add it to the website in the Living Systems exhibition. Um, so I will, I will share that with you at a later date because your responses to the questions made for beautiful poetry. Okay, I shall stop sharing um, and introduce Adrian, who's gonna introduce and, and chair the next part of the uh, afternoon, which is presentations by each of us in the Living Systems Lab. Um, followed by a panel discussion. So Adrian Holm is an artist, an educator, writer and editor, and he lectures on the MA on Science at Central St. Martins um, and has a background in biological science as well as fine arts. His research interests centre on alchemy, AI, impact of technology upon human agency and all things biological. So Adrian, over to you. Well, hello, everybody. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. And um, 
Welcome to the second part of the symposium today, where we have, as Heather said, presentations from each of our five presenters who are going to present for 10 minutes. And um, that will be followed at, um, will be followed by a question and answer and discussion section at uh, 10 past four. So um, do, do think up questions as, as the people are presenting and uh, you can put the questions into the Q&A section, which is uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll find the Q&A there. So do put your questions in there and we'll have a, a nice discussion at the end. So um, I'd like to introduce Alice Taylor, who is a bioengineer and a lecturer in biology and living systems. And Alice is at Central St. Martins. And Alice's presentation is entitled, Challenging the Diamond Stereotype from Gems to Brains. Okay, Alice, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, I suppose in terms of the Living Systems Lab, you know, I'm a relatively new member of this group. And before joining Central St. Martins, I was a researcher working in biomaterials. Um, and actually, you know, my background is in chemistry and engineering and biotechnology. And so this is a completely new environment for me. And it's really fascinating being um, made aware of all these different types of working and working with, within this really exciting group. So I have a different angle from everyone else in the group. I think that you'll see by the end of today's session that we really have this great interdisciplinary core and we are really we're all excited to be working together so yeah i'm going to be talking about using diamond as a biomaterial today so at first i'll just talk a little bit about regenerative medicine um this was the the reason why i became so fascinated in biomaterials and and regenerative medicine is the process of replacing engineering or regenerating human tissues in order to establish um, or restore original function. So this is often um, something that happens, especially at the moment with an ever increasing aging population, that the stem cells that we all have inside of our bodies, they start to replace and rejuvenate at a slower rate. And so we end up be being aware of much more different types of these regenerative diseases and so it's this rejuvenation that I'm really fascinated in um, and and it was because of this I started researching with stem cells um, and specifically I'll talk a bit about the stem cell that I I used and that I integrated with diamond so Neurological implants, there are, there are different types of implants. There are sensory substitution implants. So these can be retinal, cochlear or cortical. Um, and this is where the majority of my research has been on these, these types of implants. Then there are experimental implants to record brain activity. Um, they can be used to, to act as an interface between brains and computers. And they also can be used as deep brain simulation devices to treat different tremors or Parkinson's and even depression. There's lots of research into these quite radical implants and that some of the results have been really remarkable. Then also there's biomedical prosthetics for restoring function after injury or after um, something like a stroke, for example. So, I was working um, with diamond as a bio material and it's a really wonderful material. It might be quite surprising that it has this um, niche application within the brain, but actually diamond has a broad range of really exceptional physical properties. And one of these is that when you grow diamond in the lab, and this is what I did a lot throughout my research career, you can integrate it with different elements and turn diamond into a, a semiconductor. So it's almost like a metal. So then with this, you have this electrical device. Also diamond is predominantly carbon and us as humans, we're made mostly of carbon. So you end up actually with really great biocompatibility. So I think it was in 2004, actually the first 
time that neuron cells were grown on diamond and it worked amazingly. And then, since then, there's lots of groups over the world do, doing research on this. So my, my research focused on diamond and its it, it, um, application in these neurological implants. So this here is um, an image of a naturally occurring diamond. And you can see that, you know, it's quite rough when it's found in the ground. And this is actually quite a large one. Um, but in fact, the diamond which I worked with is not a gem. We don't use it for its luxurious properties at all. In fact, we're just fascinated with the physicality of this material. So this slide quickly just shows a bit about how we define what, what diamond is. And it's to do with how the carbon is bonded within this material. So it's the bonding arrangements of the carbon that give diamond its absolute hardness. You know, it's the hardest material known to man. Um, and here are some other images of bonding and it gives different properties within the carbon allotropes. So this photograph here, uh, the, the top two, they were taken during my PhD. And this was at the lab I was working in, in UCL. And this is a machine which we use to grow diamond. So in this machine, we have incredibly high temperatures and really low pressures, and we're able to grow diamond at a relatively slow rate, but in fact, our purity was, was really good. So this was the material I was using to um, investigate with these neural stem cells. So I'm gonna skip through this quickly, but this is just highlighting how amazing diamond is as a material. So yeah, I was fascinated with how could we integrate this material within the brain? Um, and the brain is, you know, it's, this incredibly complicated organ, but I think it's, it, I can simplify the functions quite nicely. Um, and the, the way the brain works is it's a combination of different cells. And these cells start out as stem cells and they have their differentiation. So this is, you have this, the original cell and throughout its life cycle, it will change into a more specialized cell. And the factors that affect this are, you know, they're broad, they're varied, they can be chemical, they can be mechanical, they can be because of the cell's relationship and interaction with its surrounding environment. And it's not very well understood and often it can be deemed as random. So I wanted to look at how these neural stem cells differentiated on diamond. So we have neural stem cells and they can differentiate into neurons, um, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes and microglia. And neurons are the most important cell type in the brain. They're responsible for um, how we think, how we feel, how we move and comprehend. And these other three cell types, they really help regulate and maintain a healthy brain environment. So with these neurons, we, you know, they're the most important, but without these other three types of cells, we wouldn't have a safe, healthy environment for the neurons to thrive and to give us all these um, properties that allow us to, to live. Um, so I think quickly, I'll just mention gliosis. And this is the biggest issue with brain implants. Gliosis is when you have an overproduction of these supporting cells. So you have an implant, you put it into the brain, and the brain thinks it's a foreign body. Of course it is, but in, in you know, the, these applications, it's a foreign body that gives function and helps the brain. But the cells, you know, sometimes they're not aware of this and they will surround this implant and shield it from being able to connect with the neurons and then it doesn't work anymore. So this is a big issue. And I'll just move on to talk a bit about nanodiamonds, which are really small diamond particles, which I have used to coat these diamond devices. And actually what we found is that when we grow these neural stem cells on these nanodiamond substrates, the, the neural stem cells spontaneously differentiate into neurons. So this is a beautiful image of 
neural stem cells which have been plated on a diamond substrate and left to grow for a month. And we let them grow and we continue to change the media, um, but we didn't give any external factors. So whatever the cells differentiated in was completely resultant of the interaction that it was having with the surface. And here you can see we've stained the neurites in green and we've got beautiful neurite network. This is a really healthy neural network, which has, is, you know, it's functioning and it's differentiation has been because of its interaction with the diamond. So here's another beautiful image, higher magnification using fluorescence microscopy, just outlining these neurites, they're defined, they're prominent, and they're really healthy. So this is wonderful news for um, if we're going to be inter integrating diamonds into brain environments. So I think, yeah, I'll just tie it off at the end that Diamond promotes this differentiation of human neural stem cells into neurons. And it does this by the interactions which we have on the surface of the biocompatible diamond. And it, it's really exciting for the integration into neural, neurological implants because it reduces this gliosis, this glial scarring, which is really detrimental um, for medical advances. So, yeah, um, I think I'm, my research is quite different from the rest of the Living Systems Lab in terms of I, my, my um, systems are tend to be human, but I think you'll realize that there's a strong correlation between environment and systems and networks. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my slides now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Alice. That was great. Um, so um, our Nancy is ready to present now. So we're going to take uh, Nancy Dinish's uh, presentation towards a semi-living materiality. Thank you. Can you see it? I hope so. <laughs> so I'll start with this slide. Of course, this is a very, a very familiar image to many of us that are passionate about integration of living systems into materiality. And what we can see here, there are many things occurring and many of them, I actually don't really understand them myself because I'm not a scientist and biologist, but as an architect, I see biological community interacting with very different organisms. I mean, you can have moss here, probably you have lichens, but probably you have soil. Soil has a lot of bacteria. And what I can see here is this community of living organisms in conjunction with, conjunction with uh, an infrastructure. And this becomes very interesting for me as an architect because what I can hear what I can read is this mutualistic relationship between living organisms and the man-made infrastructure. So I take this as a designer into my work and I explore this relationship between non-living and living matter. And specifically, I'm very interested in exploring design workflows towards models of semi-living materiality. And I can describe our design process into material selection, material manipulation, then we select a particular living system, and then we go through a, a very scientific protocol of sterilization, inoculation, incubation, colonization, and then finally stabilization, where we decide if this system is going to live or is going to, in a way, terminate its life cycle. So this is more or less how we start thinking about making material systems. And this image really encapsulates what I just said, because what, can, what we can hear here, we can, we can see here is a particular material, a substrate. Then we can see a particular living system that has colonized it. It started in this case is mycelium. You probably all know what mycelium is, but mycelium is basically the roots of the vegetative part of the mushrooms. And it's basically a network of fungal branches that start secreting enzymes and start feeding into any kind of biological material that they can find. And they start secreting enzymes and they start breaking down biological components, such as say. 
So this is a, one of my favorite images because this is how I started doing biomaterials. And it reveals a lot of exciting things for me as a designer. It reveals that you don't actually need glue, you don't need hardware, you don't need molds. You can potentially design a structure that can grow forever if it has the appropriate environmental and nutritional conditions. So in our work, it's very much about manipulating materials through computational design process, processes and then selecting microorganisms where you can grow on these materials and then biofabricate um, modular systems. So modularity is kind of a, the, the way we scale up the, the prototypes. So this is a wide, I mean, a selection of, of living systems we've been working with. I am by no means an expert in all of them. I've been working a lot with mycelium in the past five years, but we've experimented with other, with other living systems and we are totally fascinated by them. They are very different, uh, these living systems here, they are very different from each other. They grow in different ways. They, 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 they require different nutrition uh, and environmental conditions, but they are all very fascinated. We are fascinated by them and we appropriate some of their characteristics into our, into our practice. Some of them are unicellular, some of uh, others are pluricellular, and we appropriate some of their characteristics depending on, on the material on an experimentation or fabrication that we are doing at the moment. So we are very interested in this relationship. How do we combine living with a synthetic environment? How do we provide a synthetic scaffold where this material can thrive, can grow, can interact with the environment? So how do we design this scaffold, right? So we spend a lot of time designing uh, these environments, speculating on how these things can integrate our daily lives. How can they integrate material systems at different scales? Uh, from product design to architectural scale, even urban scale, we don't go uh, at that scale in our practice, but we speculate uh, on how this would be possible. So this idea of living architecture is a concept that's been going on for several decades now. It's nothing really new and many architects really ex explore this notion of living architecture, living systems, living materials. And other examples of us, you know, uh, growing bioluminescent bacteria, exploring uh, ideas around biosensing and having living systems uh, uh, representing invisible phenomena is something that we really um, are very focused on. So materials are very important for us. We really try to not use any uh, other materials uh, than waste streams. So we do a lot of experimentation, research on out, uh, outsourcing, uh, waste streams, upcycling uh, different kinds of waste from domestic, agricultural uh, packaging, something that we do a lot. We recycle a lot of paper. And then we, of course, are very, uh, I think it's because we are designers and architects, we are fascinated by geometry and form. And we explore this with computational design processes. And I'm going to show you a little video that kind of shows our process. Thank you. 
I hope you kind of gave you an overview of our form making process, how we use computational design to simulate form. And I just want to show you some examples now of module systems where we've been collaborating with different living systems. So of course, I, I've mentioned that we work with mycelium a lot. We create our own uh, mycelium strains. These are some examples. We experiment with different mycelium strains. Uh, and then you can see on the right, a modular system where we start uh, testing this idea that we don't need any hardware, we don't need any joints. Mycelium and the modules will aggregate themselves and the mycelium will, will merge them together. So this is what an idea that we've been exploring a lot. And we do a lot of research finding substrates, finding a um, lot of research and experimentation of finding the substrates, finding um, biofilaments for our experiments. But a very important thing is that, you know, we want to, in a way, challenge this idea, a very modernist idea of architecture, which looks at surfaces that are very polished, very smooth. And, you know, white walls is a very modernist and outdated uh, uh, kind of notion that we kind of challenge because bio design, biomaterials is not really about that. So it is this tactile and um, uh, experience and we do explore that with our materials in terms of surface and uh, in, uh, exploring other, other properties like for example acoustics. So modularity is key. This is one of the um, projects we developed with mycelium panels and going beyond incorporating an, uh, an, 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 an element that kind of cleans the air and how we can look at patterning by increasing the surface with the contact of the air so the air is clean. So all this, you know, another uh, example of, of a modular system that we've just uh, been uh, working on. Um, in this case, not using molds, but by 3D printing the elements. So we believe that both uh, have um, positives like you either using the mold or using the 3d print but of course 3d printing is very very interesting for us because you can really save um uh time doing molds and you can really create different modules um so i'm gonna just wrap it up brady i think i think this is my kind of last yeah, image that's, uh, yeah, to... yeah this is my last image so thank you Great, thank you so much, Nancy. That's fantastic. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Do um, do put questions into the um, into the Q and A button. I can see there are a couple there. Um, yes, keep them coming, please. So the next person is Carol Colley. Carol is a professor in design for sustainable futures uh, at Central St Martins, and Carol's presentation today is entitled Biotextiles towards the next generation of sustainable textiles. Carol. Thank you, Adrienne. I will share my screen. Can you confirm you can all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Can you confirm you see the different slides? Yeah. Great. OK. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you so much, um, Nancy. It was a great introduction to a lot of the organisms that we'll also be uh, referencing. Um, I'm a textile designer by training. Uh, that's a long time ago, about 30 years ago. But I'm also an ecologist, and I've always been interested in, in trying to reconcile my passion for nature and, and um, ecological practice together with being a textile designer. The textile industry, and I won't go in depth into, into facts and, and numbers here because this is not the point, but this is what starts my quest. The textile industry is highly toxic for our environment. Textiles are incredible. They are what, what link all of us as humans, every civilization, every ethnic, uh, every culture has had and has developed a particular craft and, and an approach to making textiles. You know, we all wear textiles, we do need it. So it's not like it's a kind of superfluous kind of industry. But the way the industry currently works is based on the principles you can see on the left. It's extractive. Uh, in that it's about extracting raw materials, whether it's crude oil to make polyester or whether it's uh, harvesting natural fibers like cotton. Uh, it's linear in that we take materials, we use them and we dump them. 
it's highly toxic for our water system, whether it's rivers and sea, uh, our oceans, whether it's to do with air or soil. It's mostly oil based. Uh, uh, about 70% of our textile production is polyester made from oil. Um, it's of course in excess of CO2 emission. We need to cut 50% of our CO2 emission in this industry in the next nine years to beat uh, our deadline of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. Um, and it's exploitative when it comes to uh, uh, workers. That's, an in, that's the current industry. And I'm not proud of saying, uh, as a designer, I work for that industry. And so 30 years ago, I started looking at other ways to think about what, how else can we make uh, textiles? Um, and looking at a lot of, you know, uh, solutions such as you know recycling, upcycling, the notion of circularity, but it's really when I hit biology that I understood here is the new system. This is what we need. I think the industry doesn't need an increment incremental uh, improvements. We need a radical new way to think about how we design and make textiles, and we need to move move toward a system which is regenerative, circular, nurturing, bio based. CO2 negative in that it would extract more CO2 from the atmosphere than it would release and being inclusive in terms of our workers. To do this, we need to really reimagine a complete different way of, of designing. And so this is where my research takes me. It's very much informed by biomimicry principle um, and the notion of a nature inspired design strategy. I use living systems thinking to prototype new ways of biofabricating uh, textiles. What I'm interested in is in really researching references, models which are life conducive and that we found in nature. Nature has evolved around uh, 3.8 billion years to you know, work in relation to its system. It's cyclic, it's local, it's solar. It doesn't create biotoxic products. Whatever is a waste in nature is actually the nutrient for another set of living systems. So I want to reference and research this and I want to really simply even understand it better. Uh, and that's what drives my inquiry into a radical new way to think about making textiles. Quite often people ask me, but who, you know, what are you? I don't understand. Are you a researcher? Are you a designer? Are you a biologist? And, and actually it's very difficult to define who I, who I am and what I am. I'm, I'm many things and I'm quite often at the intersection of different practices. I'm an ecologist, I'm a researcher. Sometimes I call myself a bioartisan, a textile maker, a designer, a critic, a biotinker, a future maker. But what drives my work is very much uh, the fundamentals of ecology. And I don't really stick to one particular process, one particular technique. I'm quite keen to explore loads of different ways we can mimic uh, natural systems. So I reference textile craft and textile techniques, but I will also use photography, to plant tissue engineering, setting up various biological experiments. Uh, using living system thinking to drive uh, my research and really think, thinking about designing with not just humans, but non-human species in mind. So what I read is that. I read anything to do with horticulture, botany, permaculture, plant science, synthetic biology, soil science. That's what drives my quest uh, for new knowledge. And that's the key question that drives my work. How does nature make a textile? If you really want to think uh, about embedding biomimicry principles in your work, this is the very first question you need to ask yourself. Find a model in nature. How does nature do it? Because we need nature, we know nature does it in a way that's very life conducive. And actually, if you think about textiles, there's a lot of exquisite examples of how nature makes a textile not a fiber. And this is really a, a clear difference here. I'm interested in looking at a ready-made fabric-like material, because currently when we harvest natural materials in our textile industry, we will take a material, turn it into a fiber, into a, a yarn, into a fabric. And I'm trying to bypass all those different steps. As opposed to grow a fiber, I want to grow a fabric, like you can find these examples. So this is a particular uh, mushroom, which I, I really like. Of course, this is not a permanent material, it's very fragile. But what that tells me is that there's a set of codes, DNA codes in nature that will instruct this mushroom to grow this morphogenetic little skirt in, in terms of its, its, its patterning principles. So that's really interesting. You might be more familiar with the coconut bark. You might have seen that. It looks a little bit like a woven cloth. 
But the lace bark, which you can see here now, this is the inner bark produced by a tree, which um, is called the lageta lageto tree. Um, and this is grown again at ambient temperature using local nutrients, sun energy, water. This looks like a woven cloth, but it's actually something that has grown over time and it's part of uh, uh, the, the sort of skin of a tree, the, the inner bark of a tree. So again, here's an example in nature of growing a fabric. And so I'm not making this up. This is not surreal. This is actually real. Again, I can see when I look at that, okay, there's a set of DNA code out there that actually instructs the tree to create that very woven materiality, but it's grown at ambient temperature. And an example, another um, organism I'm, I'm a big fan of is the nickname is the Venus flower basket, uh, the Ubiclecla aspergillum. Um, and this grows at the bottom of our ocean system. It's a sea sponge. And it has been proven, it's been researched um, that actually you can see the little fiber at the bottom there. They're actually quite soft fiber. They have fiber optic properties superior to the fiber optics we can manufacture ourselves. So again, an interesting way to think about, okay, fiber optics that grow at the bottom of our ocean floors that are um, superior in some ways uh, compared to the ones we make. So again, looking at this notion of nature as a model is critical to my practice. But I'm also interested in thinking about this notion of code and coding. Um, so I'm not like Nancy, I actually don't do uh, biocomputation. I'm a real craft maker, but I'm interested in the concept of coding and the, com and the notion of coding. And if you look at a natural system, it's based on a DNA code, the ACTG, the four chemicals that make life. And these various combinations of DNA gives us this incredible diversity of life we find on this planet. In design and manufacture, we use coding, and we've traditionally used in the past 50 years, a lot of, or more than that, 100 years, uh, sort of CAD CAM mad made uh, textile manufacturing using a binary code. But we've used a binary code since the very beginning of uh, time when we started weaving, because weaving is taking one yarn, dropping one yarn, so it's a one and zero, uh, the ancestor of computing. So we are used to work with a binary code. But now we have the potential, and this is going into synthetic biology, where we can look at combining both the binary code and the DNA code to actually program new genomes and program new organisms. So I'm very interested in looking how we navigate this nature-made to human-made to the, what I call the grow-made world, which is now emerging. And this is a framework I've developed uh, about 10 years ago now when I was preparing a curation of an exhibition uh, called Alive, which was mapping out this new landscape of uh, biodesign practice. And I'm interested in looking at how we can use nature as a model, all the way to nature as a co-worker, so collaborating with living systems or hacking the living systems. And I'm interested in, in working across those three different uh, models. I do work on loads of different projects uh, in parallel. We don't have time today for me to go in depth about all of them. So I've decided to curate this mini presentation around two main topics. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my passion for roots. I absolutely have a fascination for root systems. So I'm going to show you three projects here that actually are uh, looking into root systems. Um, Roots are incredible. We don't often see them. We don't often think of them. They are a sensing organism. Uh, they have many different types of architecture. They allow for nutrient flow, but they allow for communication between uh, plants and between trees. Um, and if you look, for instance, here on, on the, the plant called the Balsamorisa sagittata uh, number C, it's five centimeters high, but actually the roots can go up to two meters. So there's a lot going on in that invisible world we don't think of. And, and I think that's really fascinating. The rye plant is particularly interesting because uh, if you were to measure the surface of uh, the rye plant, uh, you would get around 639 square meters. But if you were to measure its root system, it would represent 622 kilometers and a daily growth rate of five kilometers. So a huge proportion at a time when we're talking about scarcity in terms of food systems, in terms of materials, we have the example of this plant that can grow very, very fast. Um, and that's also interesting. 
But I've started looking into, okay, but where do roots come from? When did they begin to evolve? And, and this is dated around 420 million years uh, ago. These, these are the first sort of masses that started to create a root system. Um, so what I'm doing is really effectively, I'm interested in learning from a living system that is at least 400 million years, because that is still far superior to a lot of the things we can do as humans today. So, uh, Carol, sorry to interrupt. That's um, that, that's uh, over ten minutes. Okay. So if you could um, draw draw to a close, please. So I'll just uh, show this this particular example. So this is the idea of thinking of how could we control road systems, and how could we actually reimagine uh, a new way to manufacture textiles. And this is a scenario. This is a project developed in 2012 as a future scenarios of growing hydroponic plant systems to grow food and textiles at the same time. And this would be done through synthetic biology. And so by understanding natural models, I want to look at how we can redesign a potential future manufacturing system and biofacturing systems, uh, learning from nature. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Carol. That was a really fascinating presentation. Um, I'd now like to introduce Rob Kessler, who is a Professor of Art, Design and Science uh, at Central St. Martins. And Rob is going to talk about uh, science beyond the visible, collaboration and communication through micro-imaging. Hi, sorry about that. So uh, I'm an artist and I work with visual things like this um, detail of a section through, um, detail of a section through uh, a wild orchid, which I made in Portugal at the Gold Banking Science Institute 10 years ago. Um, um, and in a sense, art and science are a process and a product. I see it as a kind of a synthesis of two expansive cultures and a way of examining the world through a series of filters. Um, and as an artist, I create responses to questions I've yet to formulate. And I've worked as an artist for over 50 years, and most of that time was driven by a process of uh, observation and response and a fascination um, for the living world. Um, and 20 years ago, I kind of, I realized that the creative potential of microscopy was underexploited. And I was fortunate enough to develop a link with the botanical scientists at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, uh, who introduced me to the wonderful world of scanning electron microscopy, uh, and which subsequently through exhibitions, and videos, a number of kind of uh, publications and lectures, I've created work that has really sought to contribute to an expanded awareness and appreciation and understanding of the complexities of the living world. And the SEM is a, a remarkable kind of microscope. It gives amazing kind of definition at very high magnification. So here there's a kind of a, a mixture of pollen grains, uh, stomatal cells, leaf hair, um, kind of detail shots. Some of these magnified up to you know, four or 5,000 times. But, an essential part of my practice is to introduce color to the black and white images. And the color is based on the original plant, the functional structures, and my own response to the character of the specimen. And just as the plant uses color to attract an audience of insect collaborators, I use color to attract you. And this is a one pollen grain magnified about 1800 times of a pollen from a pine tree caught on the fibers of the pollen filter from my car when it was being serviced. Um, here's a whole kind of collection of these. Um, and there, what it reveals is the kind of, both the kind of structural and kind of stunning kind of diversity um, of something so small that you can't see it with a naked, you can't see its structure with a naked eye. R Rob, sorry to interrupt. I don't think we can see your slides changing. We're seeing the BBC News 
uh, slide. Oh, really? Oh God. Okay. Uh, that, that, that's all you can see. Let me try again. Can you see that? Yes. I'm just. Can I just go back a few slides then? Sure. Yes. Absolutely, Rob. Yeah. Uh, but they don't seem to be going back now. No, it's not. Um... Yeah. Okay. So, uh, provided you could hear me, this is the electron microscope, which gives this kind of phenomenal resolution. And these are um, pollen grains, um, seed uh, detail structures, coatings, hairs from plants. Uh, and this was one, this is the one pollen grain of the pine uh, caught on the fibers of the pollen filter from my car. Uh, and they reveal this kind of great diversity of uh, structures, which are kind of tied to kind of different families of plants. Okay. Um, more recently, I've, I've kind of sought to kind of go beyond just creating kind of uh, these kind of stunning images, if you like. Um, and this was the first project, which was with the BBC. Um, and it was uh, Matthew Tucker approached me. He wanted to do a project about seeds that were becoming important for uh, maintaining biodiversity. Um, there's not time to show the kind of whole project, but I'll post it up um, in, the, in the chat at the end of this. Um, but he, what was interesting, he approached me because my images were stronger than the kind of scientists were producing. And that's, that's my artistic kind of sensibility, if you like. Um, but I want to talk more, more about a more recent project, um, an airborne. Um, and it's a project that explores pollutant particles on the surfaces of leaves. And this is uh, an aerial view of uh, the museum of uh, the Garden Museum next to Lambeth Palace in London, very close to where I live. Uh, and this is a holly ilex tree on the outside. And I've been working with um, technology called uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectrometry with uh, Dr. Louise Hughes at uh, Life Science Product Manager at Oxford Instruments. Um, and uh, she's able with this technology to, uh, to isolate individual elements on the surface. Because I can look at this and it looks very interesting, but I, I can only speculate at what it might be. Uh, and I might color it up in that way. It's possibly an aluminum particle, but I'm not quite sure. And like this, this is a kind of a mineral or salt crystal uh, caught in the uh, uh, hairs on the surface of the leaf. Um, so this is what the original image looked like. Uh, this is a pretty grubby kind of surface. But when you isolate different elements here, aluminium, magnesium, calcium, silica, uh, you get a very different kind of image. And I was keen to try and use the knowledge of those different elements, of the individual elements, in my response to how I kind of introduce color. And the image reveals a kind of micro Bruegelian kind of landscape, uh, complex crystallized terrains in turmoil, in a sense that belies sinister implications and recall the kind of predictions of J.G. Ballard. So it's quite a, in a sense, it's quite a kind of literary response to that kind of image. So we use ilex leaves because of their kind of durability um, and also pine needles for their kind of filtration properties. And I collected samples between Lambeth Palace and Greece on a kind of overland kind of journey. And this is from the uh, Botanic Garden in Padua, the oldest botanic garden in the world. And again, you can see these are all different elements caught on the surface. This is high in the Peloponnese, Lake Akrata, um, very isolated, very beautiful kind of location. And this is a pine needle a detail of a pine needle showing us these rows of stomatal cells, uh, this kind of stoma, which is a breathing aperture of the plant. And using EDS, you can see uh, different elements. Even here, it's not completely clean. There's kind of silica, aluminium, um, and oxygen and carbon on the surface. And this is an, an ordinary colored uh, image showing that stomatal cell and the bits of crud which are kind of drawn towards the 
uh, St. Mark of Sel. This is in the Alps. You can start to see that the kind of surface is looking dirtier. There are kind of more particulates on the surface um, being drawn into the kind of stomatal cells. And this is the Botanic Garden in Geneva, next to a very busy road and in a big city centre. And again, you can see the buildup of material on the surface. It's quite coated. And here are the individual elements uh, picking out magnesium and potassium. Uh, Potassium, silica, aluminium, and kind of detail of, of that surface. And I'm just going to finish with a short, very, very short video um, of uh, kind of movie I put together to kind of show the different layers that go into um, isolating the individual elements um, as a journey uh, into the surface and to build up a kind of final image. So this is a kind of piece of crud on the surface with a pollen grain next to it. So each of these filters is isolating an individual kind of range of elements. And as scientists and artists, we see the world through a series of filters and we adjust those filters and observe difference. There's a flex of iron on the surface. And it draws to a close. That's the kind of final image that created from that knowledge that was there. And I think that's a good point to stop. Um, there's a kind of um, a run through of different elements that were on the surface and, and where they were collected. Um, so those are the elements. And I think I'm going to hand back to Adrian. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rob. That was really fascinating. Um, the final presenter today is Heather Barnett, who is a, an artist and lecturer, my colleague on the MA Art and Science. And Heather's presentation is on invitations and interruptions, co-inquiry with living systems. And do, do keep posting your questions in the Q&A. I can see there's a number there already. Heather. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my slide. Let me know if you can't. So today's talk um, will focus on the nature of the relationship between me as an artist and the living systems I work with, which I see as a form of negotiated co-inquiry. Uh, but in real terms, it can also be seen as a series of invitations and interruptions. Previously, I've worked with a number of biological materials, including my own skin organisms and cells, botanical matter and model organisms, such as fruit flies. The living systems I'm currently working with have particular properties in common and include slime mold cells, ant colonies and human groups. I'm interested in the individual characteristics of these organisms and what they share and what one group in particular can learn from the others. I won't give you any prizes for guessing which one I think can learn most. If we look at the similarities, each of these organisms is capable of complex information distribution, intricate communication strategies, and high-level problem solving. All possess a form of collective memory. All are intelligent, though in different ways. To start with ants, I've always been fascinated by ants. As a child, I would watch the activity of a nest for hours. Things haven't changed much. Individually, an ant is relatively stupid. She has a small brain with only a quarter of a million neurons, that compared to a human brain which has around 100 billion brain cells. The intelligence of ants lie at the global scale of the whole colony, 
Some colonies live for many decades and learning is passed down through generations, a form of epigenetic inheritance. I'm fascinated by the capacity to self-organize around a problem and curious to see how a colony responds to my interventions. So here you can see an offering of food, raisins and bread placed equidistant from the nest entrance, some soaked in honey. I was interested to see how they would identify the sudden appearance of food and how they would deal with it very efficiently. Here you can see the communication mechanisms at play within the colony, quickly sending out patrol troops to assess the situation and when they realize the size of the problem sending for backup. The ants work together efficiently without any instruction to move the food into the nest. You can also see other foraging ants continue with their usual task of collecting grass, unconcerned about the drama on their doorstep. But as the problem persists, more ants are drawn from the nest to help move the giant food offering. The ants got there in the end and all the food was safely deposited in the nest. I also wanted to see how much they rely on the pheromone signals they leave in their environment, creating trails that help others, uh, other ants direct and navigate. So I found a, an established trail between a nest site and the thistle plant from where they were harvesting grass. And the trail went over quite rough terrain of small pieces of gravel. I was curious to see what would happen if I moved individual pieces, would the trail get disrupted? And how long would it take to re-establish? These field studies shot at La Hoya Art and Ecology Residency in Almeria in Spain, provide me with important information and inspiration and allow me to interact with a living system in its natural habitat. But I also work in more controlled settings, often within scientific research laboratories. Here, during an artist residency with the Swarm Lab in New Jersey Institute of Technology, they study swarm intelligence across different species and systems. So I wanted to explore to what extent I could employ the ant colony as an image making system, utilizing its inherent communication mechanisms of pheromone trail formation. So I invited a critical mass of New Jersey pavement ants to forage in an arena and I captured their movements. Rather than looking at the individual ants, I was interested in the global perspective, how trails were established over time within the group. So what you see here is a composite of images showing the behavior of the mass as territory is mapped and food sources found. Everything you see here in white, except the cent central dot is ant the colony as image making system. And we'll watch it for a while. Slime molds. For those of you not familiar with slime molds, they are a single celled amoeba like organism which creep around the forest floor digesting rotting vegetation. It's they operate as a collective, millions of cells sharing a cell membrane and communicating as one through chemical signaling. They are curious and nomadic, here escaping from one petri dish in my studio looking for new adventures. They have no sensory organs, no central nervous system and no brain. Yet the slime mold can perform tasks way beyond its cellular means. It can solve mazes and form efficient networks. It has spatial and temporal memory that help it navigate its environment and anticipate events. It can learn from its environment and it can pass that learning onto other slime molds, even after lying dormant for over a year. Over the past 20 years, scientists from a range of fields have been trying to understand how it can perform such complex tasks from such simple elements, tasks that we associate as cognitive or at the very least computational. I've been working with slime molds for over 10 years now and they continue to fascinate me and surprise me. I create environments for them to navigate and I intervene as I capture their growth behaviors through time-lapse photography. My studies tend to take a question oriented approach. How does it navigate its terrain? What happens when I remove its food source? Or what happens when I introduce two genetically identical slime molds? Will they interact? Will they fuse and become one? Let's watch.
beautiful unison. Um, slime molds and ant colonies are some of the most resilient uh, living systems on our planet. They operate in constant dialogue with their environment and they are incredibly agile in adapting to changing conditions. Whereas humans, on the other hand, are not always so flexible. As the complexity of an organism increases, its capacity for self-organization tends to decrease. Add to that a heightened sense of the individual and the spontaneous collective coordination we see in other creatures is hard to find. I like to test the capacity for collective communication and cooperation between species by inviting groups of humans to enact some rules of being slime mold. This playful participatory experiment invites people to embody a different life form for a while, to let go of human ego and try to operate in a more nuanced and responsive way. This process of thinking with another organism extends to other forms of co-inquiry, using the slime mold as material, model and metaphor to explore fundamental mechanisms of networks and systems at biological, social and urban scales. So whether in the studio, the laboratory or the field, my working materials are the inherent properties of these systems. My aim is to draw attention to the behavioural complexities of other life forms, particularly those that operate socially and collectively, to lower our perceived hierarchy of species and to challenge human exceptionalism. There are many different forms of intelligence in life and they all need to coexist. To end, I want to bring things to our current situation. Over the past months, with travel cancelled and many projects postponed, my attention has fallen more locally on the interspecies interactions of my compost bin. I've been observing and capturing the processes of transformation from human food waste to worm created hummus, creating nutrient rich compost for my garden and observing the opportunistic ants who have taken up residence in this safe and fertile habitat. I'm endlessly fascinated by the interconnections and interactions within our complex ecosystems. But this interest goes far beyond simple curiosity of how living systems operate. It has become increasingly important for us as a species to better understand the part we play within multi-species dynamics in our environment. We have to look no further than the emergence of COVID-19 to see how our interventions into natural habitats can cause a chain of multi-species reactions resulting in massive global disruption. As an artist and an educator committed to planetary health across species and scales, I see my role as something of a storyteller, sharing tales of incredible feats of natural phenomena, a spokesperson raising the status of unknown or neglected organisms, an amplifier using artistic, playful and aesthetic methods to draw people in, and an instigator trying to create the conditions for something interesting to emerge. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Heather. Um, so um, I'm sure you you have more questions. There are questions that are coming up in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, I'd like all the all the panelists should put on their uh, put on their camera. That's great. Um, so let's start off with some questions. Um, okay. Well, there's one question about to Nancy. Um, do you see um, do you see biomaterials to Nancy and also to Carol? Do you see biomaterials as as the future of textiles? So Nancy first. So I, I leave that to Carol because she's the textile yeah. designer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Carol, do you want do you want to come in first? Yes, I mean, I think it's a it's a critical part of our, our future to really shift from a petrol centric industry to more bio based industry. Having said that, it's quite complex and it's difficult to explain in such a short time, but uh, a lot of our bio based uh, new fibers might also use uh, versions of chemicals and of course it's uh, whether they're biodegradable or not, uh, the sort of embodied energy used in actually growing these new fibers. So going from research to upscaling it to more large scale uh, uh, production is always going to be the concern uh, to make sure we don't replicate the mindset we've actually uh, used in the past centuries. Uh, but I think at least it's a, it's, a new, it's a fresh start. It's a new way to look at how we can 
uh, either grow new fibers. If you look at mycelium, we can grow using waste as a base material. Uh, but there's a lot of new fibers uh, based on biomass. So you can make a fiber from coffee waste, from soy waste. Um, and so this is all part of what we call the bioeconomy, and which is really looking at biome starting point, biomass being a renewable uh, um, resource, as opposed to crude oil, which is what a lot of uh, our uh, surrounding is made of, you know, from plastic uh, to all the chemicals used in, in, in dyeing textiles. Um, and, and oil is a non-renewable uh, material. So we need anyway, whether we want it or not, we need to look at how can we bypass the reliance on oil. And it's only through uh, biology that we can achieve this. Thanks, Carol. There's one more question from Lucy Dukes, which is an interesting one. If, if we grow fabrics on a mass scale, are there still possibilities of it disrupting nature in some way? Which is perhaps a question that uh, applies to everybody. Think about the impact of these things. But what do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, th this is what I just explained. You know, having doing small research experiments in our lab is one thing. It's how we upscale it that is critical. Um, I can perhaps name a company, uh, if you look at some, uh, someone called Mogu, it's a mycelium company based in Italy. Um, and this is really looking into how we can use biomass to actually produce biodegradable new materials for the built environment. Uh, but they are really exploring this as how can we go from this interesting research, but how can we upscale it into commercial viable products without Implement, you know, impacting too much on, on our environment. So it's very much what we need to keep in mind that we don't go from this interesting research to going back to um, using the wrong kind of energy um, and impacting on our environment in terms of water and air and CO2 emission. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Nancy, can uh, there's a question um, about, could we, from Lucy, could we make buildings from from living systems? I suppose it's a good question to ask as an architect. Yeah, so like I mentioned, I think this is a this is a very old kind of um, idea, I have to say. From the 60s, architects started really to explore this idea of living, you know, materials, living buildings. I, I would say that I don't think architects want to create complete living buildings. They want to integrate living systems into um, building systems, let's just say, living systems into building systems. So the idea is not to have closed systems, you know, but it's very much a very old vernacular architecture idea that we have to start looking at the passive systems and not rely so much, for example, in mechanical systems. So really open the the buildings into the environment and live in more biocompatibility with ecosystems. So this is what really drives, I think, architects that are interested in this integration between living and, you know, inert materials, let's just say. I don't think it's possible to have a complete living system, but there are many architects that speculate around that. Many, many architects. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Alice, I wanted to ask you, um, it, you, your work was really interesting in, in terms of the activation of, of stem cells using diamond. Is there anything, well, what for you is the significance of now being based within an art and design institution? I mean, what's, how does that, how do you differentiate your work as a sort of bioengineer? Does it, does it add something to that work as a bioengineer? Yeah, you know, I think definitely. And Maybe the, the biggest impact which now moving to St. Martin's will have on kind of my understanding is in terms of making the scientific discoveries really easy to communicate and to have, you know, to be able to demonstrate these high end scientific discoveries, but make it, see, you know, it's realistic, but to have this ability to convey these messages. So in terms of learning the tools, you know, we do a lot with our master students on data visualization, scientific communication, and it's really, you know, these skills which designers have um, that can make the the scientific the scientific discoveries much more open to perceptions. I think, particularly in my industry, working with diamond, 
everyone just thinks it's expensive and you know it will be ridiculously unfeasible but it's about challenging these perceptions and being radically different so yes yeah. that's great there, there was a very thank you for that there was a very specific question about what is the difference between a, a laboratory made diamond and a, a natural diamond so you know Apart i think the, price. <laughs> the biggest difference is the purity you have much higher purity with synthetic diamonds so naturally occurring diamonds are in, in the rocks in the environment and they often have lots of contaminants they also have irregular lattices so in terms of having an, an incredibly um, you know glistening gem lab grown diamonds are, are much more shiny than the natural occurring ones so they're better okay, better all round <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I think what you were saying about, I'd just like to bring in Rob, uh, Rob Kessler, because what um, what Alison was just saying about communication, I think, comes into your um, comes into your work, Rob. Um, and I, I wanted also to ask really about the um, how you see the aesthetic of the work um, of your work. Is it something that is is really functional or rhetorical or is it is it a is it does it have a value in its own right so rob what do you think uh, yeah i think it's a mixture of all of those and but it's different to the aesthetic that the scientists have so um prior to covid i was just about to start having conversations with oxford instruments they wanted to talk about how they use color within their technology and why i might use it differently so i think it's um the aesthetic really uh it's a for me it's a mixture of of, of knowledge and, and intuition and functionality um and in the end it's also, also about my artistic sensitiv sensitivity and sensibility but i'm not kind of restricted some by or constrained by some of the, the things that the scientists might be but that gives me kind of free reign. but it opens up uh, other conversations um and I think it's, I think the scientists value what I've done because they can't do it in quite the same way. They don't have the time or the need. Um, and, but they recognize that the depth, the lengths which I go to, to achieve that, because it's not a push button te technology. It's very, it's in a sense, it's very similar to working with pastels or kind of watercolors. It's that kind of, I'm doing that with my fingers. It's that kind of sensibility, but based on a lot of knowledge and a lot of interaction. So on the microscope, I do all the, I do all the microscopy. I prepare all my own specimens now so that I can really understand what I'm looking at and how I use color to convey that, that knowledge. Yes, and it's, and it's not, um, and, and the way that you're using the X-ray, that X-ray technology, um, although you are making beautiful images, there, there's also a sense that there's a kind of truth to you're preserving some kind of truth to the image in terms of the different elements that are represented there. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think because I'm, I could cut some of those images were coloured up prior to the knowledge of the, the spectro, spectroscopy, um, and so I wanted to know what what any kind of particular uh, blob on the surface was, you know, um, particularly if it's uh, something not recognisable like a pollen grain or a kind of leaf hair. Uh, and that um, that technology gives me that knowledge, which I then feed into my kind of system of kind of creating new images. Great, um, thank you, thank you. Um, well, a num quite a number of questions about slime molds um, for for Heather, um, including with good conditions and nutriment, can can a slime mold feed uh, infinitely? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is more nuanced, but let's just go with the yes for now. If, if the conditions are right, the slime mold will keep going. And uh, there's another fascinating question here from Andrea Ebert to Heather. As an educator, how to use observation to change a violent society? It's quite an ambitious... Yeah, I saw that question. That's a huge meaty question. Um, I'll answer it in a couple of ways. I mean, I think, I think the key is around self-organization and I can think of you know recent movements that have used the kind of information distribution mechanisms that you know you could, could see happening within an ant colony or a slime mold cell so Extinction Rebellion or Black Lives Matter movement is very non-hierarchical self-organizing kind of you know propagating and trying to share information um, and I, I run a, a, a network an online network called Slime Moco 
short for the Slime Mold Collective, which I set up um, very early on in my experimentation. So it's been running for over 10 years. And people have found it and joined it who have an interest in slime molds from a range of backgrounds and disciplines and, and interests. So it's very, um, yes, multi-dimensional in, in the kind of questions that people are asking of this curious organism. And recently somebody from Belarus joined and said, how can slime mold help us organize uh, uh, you know, against the, um, the, the government? Um, and you know, I don't know, you know, I, I don't think slime mold has all the answers, but I think there is you know, something to be gained from human society stepping away from its own entrenched behaviors and looking at uh, how other systems are kind of operating and communicating and you know, collectively coordinating their actions. Um, so yeah, I think, I think through self-organization and thinking about that kind of non the flattening of hierarchies may, may help society, human societies operate a bit better too. Great, great, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Nancy one thing, and maybe it applies to other people, which is really about um, your relationship with form. Um, because there's something about your use of modules, and you kept talking about the, the importance of, of modules and modular forms. And I suppose my question really is, what is the relationship with the organism? Is it a, a relationship of kind of imposing form upon an organism? Or are you working with the organism in, in a more, um, I was going to say democratic, <laughs> it's not exactly democratic, but is the organism part of the, the creation of that form? Yeah, I, <laughs> I can sound a bit obsessed when I'm in the presentations. I talk about, yeah, I repeat things over and over again. But yeah, I think modularity is the way we found to kind of scale a unit that kind of works very well to scale things up. So we have a module and we kind of uh, uh, manipulate the module and create variation. Uh, and in terms of the of the of the organism, I have to admit that we shape the organism. We try to understand how the organism grows, and then take advantage of that and try to to connect it with the way of the, the behavior of the organism. It's not purely at all on the on, on a form making and aesthetic kind of process. We try not to do that. We try to understand the organism. We try to understand how. What is the characteristic of the organism that we want to appropriate and work with that? But there's a, a significant amount of work that is about modeling, about, um, um, you know, scaffolding. I mean, each one of the, of the organisms have very particular challenges when you start working with them. So I think it's a one-to-one -one kind of case scenario. For example, mycelium, you know, it can grow very well, but other ones like, you know, bacterial cellulose, it, it, it kind of creates as a um, two-dimensional way in sheets. So each one of them has, I mean, bacteria grows everywhere, you know, so it's super versatile. Yeah, I think there is a high degree of manipulation that we do in terms of form making. That's great, thank you, Nancy. I wonder if I could bring in Carol on that because your work also touches on this kind of area of uh, relationships with organisms and, and uh, you know, possibilities of manufacture. What, what kind of relationship do you look to have with the organisms that you work with? I think it depends on, on, on which organisms, but again, it's um, tend to sort of guide and channel its, its, um, its shape and, and its behavior. Um, so that we sort of collaborate in this behavior. So by nurturing it, by providing the right environment of growth, you know, in terms of temperature, uh, humidity, heat, uh, we can guide and control. But actually what I find fascinating is when you lose control. Uh, and a lot of my work is, you know, I've got samples which are really amazing. And I'm like, how did that happen? Nothing to do with me. And clearly it has to do with me as well, but it's a way, there's a responsive feedback from the organism, which is very interesting to play with uh, creatively. Um, but it's this constant back and forth. And I, I often make the, the parallel with um, baking. You know, if you, if, if you make bread, you use yeast, you activate yeast to become a living organism to start to, you know, create these bubbles and, and, and make your bread. And so it's this sort of partnership. And we've had, a, a, you know, as humans, we have a history of collaborating with organisms to make cheese, wine, and bread. 
Um, and so we have a long history of doing this, but we haven't thought about it in these terms, in terms of design. And so now we're sort of combining this, this, ancestry, this, this kind of traditional techniques with the notion of making materials for design. So a lot of it is actually even, you know, looking how do you make cheese? How do you make bread? So it's also interesting how you control or not your living systems to create the shapes you want. Yes, okay, that, that's great. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, yes, there was a question for you, Alice, which was related, to, which was really going into asking for a bit more detail, I think, about exactly how the diamond uh, stimulates these these stem cells to differentiate in a particular way. Do, yeah, do you so I, I answered briefly in the in the chat. Um, yeah. It's incredibly complex stem cell differentiation. You know, you have these infantile cells and their whole surrounding influences what they differentiate into. And what, you know, I hypothesize is that it's the surface of this diamond, which has got nano roughness, um, which is something which the cells can stick to really nicely. You know, if we think about scale, the cells are between five to 20 microns. And so they will need to attach to something that's rougher than they are. Otherwise they kind of just slip off. Um, and so I think it's the mechanical properties of this, but also surface functionalization of diamond. You can, you have different protein absorptions. Um, I think it's a combination of these two things. And then additionally having the carb, you know, the diamond made from carbon and it just being kind of bio inert almost. Um, you know, in this symbiosis between these things, one that's carbon and living, one that's carbon and not living. Yes, I was thinking about the bio-inertness, because obviously you don't want the body to, to recognise it as something foreign that it wants to uh, exactly. get rid of and contain. So it wants to yeah. be, you know, integrated into the body yeah. um, as its own, almost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Um, there's a question from Stefan, which could apply to anyone really. Why, why, while the design approaches presented seem to work with ecological systems to create new systems positively, positively impacting the world, and I think that's come through in everyone's presentation. How can art uh, do more than just ecological observations? What is the next step to inspire the same creation of new systems as design does? I mean, these might be questions for both Heather and, and Rob, actually. Um, can I bring you in first, Rob? Do you have any? Thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> well, I think when I first started out doing this, I had the idea, I was working with a pollen specialist at Kew and we had the idea of doing a book and no, no publisher was in interested. I mean, they, they said great images, but there's no audience. And Kew weren't really interested either. I mean, they didn't, they, they, they saw it as a kind of illustrating science, if you like. Um, and that was not a kind of, not for popular audiences, but we did find a publisher and we did publish a book. Uh, and 15, 16 years on, it's still in print in fourth editions in eight languages. And so the power to reach those audiences um, has kind of self-proven in, in a sense. And the kind of feedback from very different kinds of people, from jewelers or from architects, um, from planners, um, from a whole, as well as kind of botanical scientists, um, so it's, it's really, um, if the images are good enough, I suppose, at the end of the day, if I can really kind of capture your imagination, and that's why the BBC came to me as a broker to go to Kew. Um, and they knew that, that I could translate their material perhaps in a way that Kew couldn't. And so I think that there's a, a big role. It's not necessarily to explain the science, um, but it's really to create a, a dynamic um, following uh, that can lead to many different kind of paths. Yes, that's great. Thank you, Rob. Can I bring you in on that, Heather? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, the sort of difference in, in you know, what art might do uh, over and above what design might, might be doing? I mean, I guess, you know, what I'm doing is, is more philosophical than practical. Um, I'm, you know, I'm interested in noticing and you know, taking notice and sh you know, sharing the things I notice with others. So that I kind of ended my talk with the, sort of the different roles that I think art has and, and kind of my relationship of amplifying 
the unsung heroes of our natural world. You know, lots of people don't know anything about slime moths. They're incredibly complex um, creatures, and you know, and and you know, understanding from them, I think, can help us think about how we operate as as a as a species. So I think a lot of what I'm trying to do is a relational exercise. It's you know working with these organisms I find fascinating in, in, in their own right, but they hold up, they're a vehicle through which we can look at ourselves and look at how we, we interact with, their, with other species and with our environment. Um, so I, I see them as a, a kind of, not a mirror to ourselves, but a, as a, a vehicle yeah, through which we, or, or we can think with them um, and, and think differently, hopefully. Yes, and, and this relates to a question, just to pick up on that, uh, from Jasper, who says not to be too radical, or not, not to be radical, but um, do you think biological systems like slime molds and ant colonies could provide a template for new global political economic collaborations, for example, using the internet as an analogy to the decentralised systems of nature? Yeah, I was going to answer, type the answer just yes with an exclamation mark. <laughs> um, you know, and, and the, the, these systems are interconnected. So, you know, the, the way something works biologically relates to how it works socially at different scales. So from a, from a small scale organism through to a kind of urban infrastructure um, and, and kind of technological uh, network systems as well. And yes, the internet is, is a, another emergent system um, which should be decentralized, but is less and less so uh, in the way that it's, it's used um, and owned. But um, yeah, I think you know, decentralization of systems and understanding how, how they work, whether it's technological, social or biological, I think it's, it's the, the questions that we should be asking of all those systems. Or, or educational, actually. I mean, I, I should also mention I'm, I'm now an ambassador for the Royal Microscopical Society. And that's to do with m me having a very different perspective to the other people within the kind of uh, the education committee that I work with with uh, the RMS and it's about breaking down those silos of kind of disciplines which never have time to communicate and I think that's something that we're all actively involved in you know I've got some good conversations now to have with Heather about ants um, as a result of watching her things today so I think it is about you know that the, the slime mold is a very good uh, discipline because it a metaphor, sorry, because it spreads out, you know, it spreads out and touches many things. And I think that's what we're trying to do as a, as a group, um, as one of many groups. I think, I think finally, I, I, if I may, I'd like to ask each of you for, we, we've talked about the bio lab, and this is a really unusual thing to have a, a bio lab within, within an art college, an art and design college. So perhaps I could start with, with Alice. Um, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we have a bio lab in, in an art and design school? So I, you know, I think I've, I've worked in scientific labs for over a decade and the culture of working in these environments, you know, you have to be incredibly meticulous and precise and we have to maintain a sterile environment. And it's these methods of working which enable you to be able to observe and really learn from the organisms. You know, if you have dirty conditions, it will really influence everything. And so it's really important in our teachings that the students are aware of, of the level that you need to go to and able to observe even simple um, biological organisms. But I, you know, I'd like to say that in terms of working in a lab, the GROW lab is, it has a wonderful atmosphere. It's a kind of a cross hybrid between a studio and a lab. And there's always a million different things going on. And the pace in which we're learning is really, really quick. Um, and I, yeah, I think it works really well being in this in creative environment. It's definitely a very different lab than what I was used to beforehand. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Carol, yes, do, do come in. That's good to be here. I just wanted to add to this that uh, with the Grow Labs comes our fabulous technician, Shem Johnson, who makes this lab an experimental space by allowing a lot of different approaches, different experiments, yet maintaining safety levels. Uh, but it's also about having the, the, you know, the right mindset and having a person in that lab that is 
willing to engage with rather peculiar demands that an artist or designer might have when they come in that space. Um, so the Grow Lab is not just a space, it's, it's a culture in itself, again, making a metaphor, but, you know, and, and this is something that's sustained uh, and that's kept alive by, um, by Shem, by our technician, uh, so that we have a different ways to, to engage with um, various protocols that uh, we use in biology. And Alice teaches in the lab as well, so when Alice is also in there, uh, it's, I think that the people who are in the lab are as important as the lab equipments, I would like to say. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Carol. Nancy, can I bring you in on that? And um... By the way, I also teach. I also teach in the grow lab. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. It's just not the scientists. But yeah, uh, I absolutely love the lab. I think it really changes the way you think about design. Um, at a, at a, uh, I mentioned this with the experiments that we do. I think we are learning how, a new vocabulary in terms of design of drawing. For me, drawing is very, very important, and we have to find mechanisms of representation for this new way of thinking and new way of, of, of making. So personally, I am super interested in representation of living systems and in communication of living systems. And I think this represents a really exciting way of thinking about design, thinking about making. So for me, that's really important. And we see the lab as a, as a place, of, it's like a design studio. So we always, we always we always joke about that, you know, that's where the magic happens for us. But mm. at the end of the day, we are designers, you know, and we have to design. So, you know, there's always like this big kind of discussion about how do we translate the Petri dish into a design idea? How do we extrapolate these principles uh, into design? Because we are doing design. We are not doing science. We are doing design. So it's very important that we don't forget this. Great, thank you, Nancy. Heather, um, why do you think it's, why does it matter to have a grow lab in an art and design institution? Well, Carol and I spent many years arguing this. <laughs> um, and Rob. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, there was, yes, it took four years to, to get it from it being an idea to a thing. Um, and you know, the, the conviction was that biology is, the you know so central to a lot of you know the, the thinking of 21st century research and thinking um how biological systems work how we work with biological systems um it, and so it it made perfect sense to us for it to be an integral workshop in in a practice-based research environment so students not only observe these organisms, but they can work with them. And it's only by working with them in you know, practice-based research that you really understand them. So we wanted to create an environment um, and we, we spent a lot of time working out what the lab should look like. So it would function as a, as a clean scientific space, but it would also have a hybrid uh, property and be a creative um, and a kind of messy space as well. Um, so, you know, kind of building that hybrid um, dimension was really important. So it is, a, it is a biology laboratory for art and design teaching and research. Great, thank you. And can I, can I bring in, finally, can I bring in Rob, um, who was also instrumental in setting up the, the, the Grow Lab? Um, um, hands on. You, know, you, you can't do it by reading about it. Yeah. It's got to be an open door. You, you can't... You, you know what it's like kind of looking down a microscope by just looking at it on a screen. Um, you don't know what um, particular fungus smells like by reading about it. You know? uh, and I think, you know, my whole life has been about really kind of direct observation and experience. Um, and it's, you know, it's essential that it, it's there if we're dealing with these things and they are central to um, many kind of, of a, educational and, um, disciplines within the kind of college and the university. You have to have something like that to be Great. real. Great. Well, I think that we've, we've run over time and had a, a great discussion. I'd like to, to thank everybody. I'd like to thank our, these, our presenters for these wonderful, stimulating presentations. Uh, I'd like to thank the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology of Lisbon for, for, being our, for hosting this event. And, um, 
And I'd like to thank uh, you, the audience, all of you for coming along today and participating and for the many questions which have, which have got into the, the Q&A. I hope you've all enjoyed it and it's plenty of food for thought and look forward to future such events. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you, Adrian. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.